Hello. Welcome to Learning with the Cleveland Orchestra. My name is Rose Breckenridge and I'm lecturer for the Cleveland Orchestra Music Study Groups. And today I want to introduce you to Antonin Dvorak's masterful Ninth Symphony, also known as From the New World. But first, let's talk a little bit about Dvorak's inspiring life that yielded such an inspiring masterpiece as his Ninth Symphony. Antonin Dvorak lived in the 19th century. He was born in 1841, uh, and he was born in a very uh, tiny peasant village uh, to a very poor family. Um, and his father actually knew uh, and noticed very soon uh, what a great love of music his son had, and he wanted his son to have more opportunities to develop that talent. And so with great sacrifice, he uh, enabled his son uh, to have more educational opportunities uh, to learn not only the violin, but other instruments and some music theory uh, with a teacher at a neighboring uh, village and town, and also to learn how to read and write uh, the language of Bohemia, where uh, Dvorak was born at the time, which was German, because of course, at that time, uh, 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 Bohemia was actually part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So when he was just a teenager at 16 years of age, his father and uncle financed him to go off to the big city, Prague, uh, to enroll in the organ school there. And uh, he soaked it all in and was learning and learning. And his goal became to become a professional musician and ultimately a composer. Um, the money ran out from dad, though, and so uh, he had to actually get a job to continue his studies at night, and uh, he earned a place at playing viol viola uh, in what would become the Czech National Opera Orchestra, uh, and at the time it was led by Smetna, uh, the great uh, leader of the Czech National School. Smetna uh, actually wrote a lot of operas, and some wonderful tone poems uh, celebrating the national heritage of his homeland. Um, and uh, Dvorak actually imbued and uh, uh, drank in that uh, wonderful influence. And of course, remembering uh, the uh, peasant folk songs and folk dances of his youth from the tiny village where he was born. Um, so he played viola during the day and at night studied and tried to compose. Uh, but his career really didn't take off, uh, and he was relatively unknown. In 1873, uh, he married one of his students. Uh, he also taught music on the side, uh, singing and piano and instruments uh, uh, in order to help support himself, and now he had to get serious about earning money. Uh, his first years of his marriage uh, were marked by great financial insecurity. Uh, the, his, he and his wife were poor as church mice and had to live actually with her parents. Um, and then they had some very uh, great tragedies uh, occur. Um, they actually lost their first three children to illness and accident. Uh, the first uh, child was died just a few days after it was born and then um, they lost a child to smallpox and also a, a child uh, to a terrible accident uh, around the home, the very crowded home, I might add. And he was anguished about this and poured his uh, self even more so into composing. And of course, one of the fruits of that was his great Stabat Mater. But he was not really recognized uh, and already he was in his 30s. But the big break came when the famous uh, composer Johannes Brahms, uh, who had been born actually in Germany in Hamburg, but had moved to Vienna and by the mid-1870s uh, had become quite famous. Uh, he actually was on a committee uh, that uh, judged the merits of compositions submitted uh, by young aspiring artists and composers. And um, he noticed uh, Dvorak's talent and skill, and he was very impressed. And he saw to it that this struggling young composer actually uh, would be able to win some grants to help support him. Because at the time uh, when he married, he had resigned from uh, the 
playing viola in the orchestra and taken on a job as an organist in the local church. So his sources of income were quite meager. So those grants meant a lot, but more importantly, what Brahms did is he actually took uh, some of Dvorak's uh, compositions, namely the Moravian duets and then the Slavonic dances, and brought them to a, uh, the attention of Brahms's very own publisher, Simrock. And once those works were published, Dvorak was no longer unknown. His fame grew immediately and he became known in Bohemia and then in Austria and Germany, ultimately in England and ultimately in the United States. Um, and so his great longing uh, was to become a, a symphonist. This is Dvorak. Uh, and he had really two mentors, Smetana, who uh, encouraged his interest in uh, the nationalistic culture, folk song and dances of his homeland. And then Brahms, the great symphonist, uh, who encouraged him in the dramatic uh, symphonic tradition as handed down in German-speaking countries. Uh, but he struggled as to how to uh, reconcile those two influences. Um, and we see the fruit of it in his Ninth Symphony uh, from the New World uh, that we're going to be uh, exploring in just a moment, uh, where he was able to bring all that together in amazing ways. Uh, he had a great melodic gift. Uh, he actually uh, had uh, the ability to create many spontaneous, fresh, uh, and increasingly abundant melodies. They just flowed out of him, uh, one after the other, rapidly. Um, and he also had the wonderful ability to color them beautifully with different um, orchestral colors. And he had the habit also of taking a great melody and setting it like a jewel surrounded by garlands of counter melodies in different colors to set it off. Um, I would go so far as to say that Dvorak is perhaps one of the greatest melodists of the 19th century. So in terms of his symphonies, he actually wrote nine altogether. Uh, and uh, the, uh, from the New World, the ninth is the great culmination. And uh, it came uh, when he was invited to uh, the United States to become director of uh, a new, uh, newly founded National Conservatory of Music. Jeanette Thurber, the great philanthropist, founded it. And her view was um, that she wanted anybody who had talent to be able to get the training to become a musician and or a composer. And so if you didn't have the money, you could still go there. She would give you a scholarship. And of course, uh, from his background of uh, a poor family, Dvorak was very sympathetic uh, to that goal. Uh, and he left his beloved Bohemia, uh, where he could walk in the meadows and the woods and listen to the birds and his larger extended family to come uh, to the United States, to New York City in uh, 1892. And he actually stayed there for three years. He didn't come alone. Uh, he brought part of his family at first, his wife and several children, then more of them later. He, uh, they were blessed by having six more children after the three that died. And he was a, a big family man, loving uh, his children gr greatly. Although while he was here, he was so homesick for his native Bohemia uh, in the big city of New York uh, that he actually one summer went out to a Czech community in Iowa, Spillville, so he could be with his native Bohemians and speak Czech and be in the out of doors. Um, so that was, that was wonderful. While he was here, uh, Jeanette Thurber encouraged him. She's a philanthropist who's founded the conservatory and headhunted him to come over here. Uh, she encouraged him to write a symphony. And uh, I already mentioned his interest in folk music. Uh, he actually uh, was very devoted uh, to the idea that the common man um, uh, had the spirit of humanity and could feel the depth of sorrow and suffering and yet rise above it and never be trapped by uh, tragic events uh, to also enjoy and celebrate the beauties of life and love and music. 
Um, and so basically uh, what he did uh, was while he was at the uh, conservatory there, he believed in the power of uh, folk music as inspiration for musical composers. And he felt that American composers who were just budding and coming uh, to the fore that would come uh, to better uh, flowering in the 20th century should turn to uh, their own folk music, if you will, of uh, their own country. And he was actually exposed to some of that. One of the students at the, um, at the conservatory, uh, he was African American and he was a wonderful singer. His name was Henry Burley. And he used to give concerts singing Negro spirituals. And so he introduced Dvorak uh, to the beauty of the uh, Negro spirituals that came uh, from the South um, and were oftentimes created by the slaves before they were freed uh, by the Civil War. And Dvorak uh, felt uh, a great sympathy and, shall we say, um, uh, camaraderie with the uh, feelings of longing and oppression that are often found in these uh, Negro uh, spirituals and more about that when we get to the actual symphony but uh, he he really also believes strongly and uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, the fact that they uh, these melancholy longing uh, songs uh, were not tragic uh, but that uh, you could rise above it uh, and uh, frequently uh, his music erupted in happy folk dances and folk songs. And so uh, going on to uh, the details, more details uh, regarding the uh, Ninth Symphony, uh, he actually uh, composed it in uh, the years 1892 to 1893, uh, just after he came to uh, New York. Uh, and a year or so later is when it premiered at Carnegie Hall. And uh, he was so proud of this work. He didn't uh, get to uh, conduct it, uh, but the premiere went exceedingly well, uh, and he was thrilled uh, with the reception. In fact, uh, he wrote uh, to a friend that the reception was, to use his word, magnificent. Uh, and so uh, in this form, which is, uh, I mean, in the symphony, which is considered to be certainly, if not his uh, most popular, um, his most masterful, both masterful and popular, uh, it follows the traditional symphonic form of four, four movements, uh, a dramatic first opening movement in allegro fast tempo, and then a contrasting slow movement uh, and then a uh, happier dance like uh, scherzo, uh, and then also uh, uh, culminating in a great uh, finale um, that is, returns to the uh, fast tempo of, of the opening. And so uh, the way he sort of combines uh, the drama and the uh, wonder, wondrous traditions of the symphonic form with folk music, let's look at the symphony a little more. Uh, closely, um, the opening uh, movement, the first movement, uh, starts with a haunting, slow introduction. Here it is. Soft and quiet. It's a kind of somber, uh, melancholy mood, but that's going to be swept away by the drama of the first movement form, uh, which uh, by this time Dvorak had definitely mastered, skillfully so. Um, and when he gets to the Allegro, which is the main body uh, of the movement, he gives us uh, the opening theme, which is quite, quite dramatic. Uh, it's this upward thrusting idea that's announced in the horns, and it actually becomes the motto symphony of not just the first movement, but the entire 
symphony because it's going to come back in every single movement. So the movements aren't like a chapters in a travelogue where first you go to Paris and then you go to Rome. Uh, no, it's all connected kind of like a novel. And even though we have contrasts of moods, uh, not only between the movements but within, uh, what knits them all together is this developing dramatic arc where the uh, motto is going to return and culminate in the grand, uh, the grand f final, uh, final movement. And so when um, this uh, motto theme is introduced, I want you to pay particular attention to it uh, because it will be uh, recurring quite often throughout the work. So we're uh, towards the end of the introduction here, uh, and we're actually going to be hearing that motto theme in just a moment. Here it comes. First in the horns. Answered by the woodwinds, again. is going to come in and give us a magnificent full-throated statement. Here it is. Now, of course, uh, contrast is uh, and conflict is part of drama. All right, uh, and he introduces it quite quickly by switching out of this dramatic mode and giving us a lovely lyric idea. In the woodwinds. Carrying it forward in the strings. This theme, not only have we introduced lyricism, but we've lifted the mood to the major key. And of course, the rest of the movement is devoted to the conflict and development of those ideas, uh, bringing back at the end uh, another statement of the motto. Uh, now, the most famous movement, of course, uh, is the Largo, uh, and the Largo, the slow second movement, uh, actually has uh, this wonderful tune that has become a Negro spiritual. Uh, Dvorak insisted that he wasn't quoting an existing uh, Negro spiritual, but rather writing a, a melody in the mode or the manner of, uh, of, of a Negro spiritual. The movement actually starts with some chords that kind of get us in the melancholy mood. And you'd be interested to know uh, that later on, this tune that's going to be introduced in the English horn actually became, if you will, a Negro spiritual because one of the students at the conservatory penned the words to going home. Here it is. with longing and a tinge of desolation even. Um, it was also, scholars tell us, inspired by uh, Dvorak's reading of Longfellow's Hiawatha and how Hiawatha uh, uh, had to uh, go across the desolate prairies uh, as he's seeking his beloved Minnehaha. 
Um, in this movement, uh, the motto won't recur until the very end, uh, but I want to skip ahead to the third movement where we lose this more melancholy mood and uh, open with high jinx and rhythm uh, with uh, a wonderful sprightly um, motif that's going to take over after the opening uh, figures in the flute and oboe. <laughs> sort of made us jump. We had this lovely little figure in the flute and oboe jumping around like children let out of school. Uh, but very shortly uh, we get a new lilting melody that has much of the flavor of a uh, uh, peasant folk song. <laughs> trio, uh, he actually turns us uh, over to almost a, a dance-like uh, figure, um, as I said, uh, bringing in the influence of his Czech heritage. All right, here it comes. <laughs> movement. Before that trio started, there was a mysterious version of the motto uh, as a kind of a hint, uh, but at the very end of the movement, um, he's going to bring that motto back in its dramatic form um, that is quite uh, dynamically robust to give us a, a, a reminiscence of the fact that this is all connected, all right? So leading up to that... <laughs> thrusting motto with the little da -da -da -dum -dum that was opening, that had opened this uh, wonderful, delightful uh, scherzo. Now we come to the final movement, uh, Allegro con Fioco, uh, fast and with fire. Oh wow, this is going to bring it all to a dramatic head. Um, and uh, actually what he does after, again, another dr dramatic uh, opening chord, um, what uh, will come out very strongly in the brass, horns and trumpets, is a very strong march-like theme. And he's going to make much of that in this movement and at the end bring it and show its similarities uh, to uh, the motto theme, especially in terms of the coloration. So here's the opening first. <laughs>
uh, utilizing the brass like the motto, but this one moves by steps, uh, whereas the motto kind of jumped up by skipping over a chord. Now this march is going to turn into a galloping idea, uh, racing, 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 that will uh, bring us, uh, uh, transition us to quite a different mood. Here's a Those racing triplets now get us into a new key and totally change the mood for our next melody, very contrasting, uh, a lyric, uh, again, sort of wistful tune uh, given over to the solo clarinet. Here it comes. Listen to the cellos, their little answer. Of course, that's what drama is all about, isn't it? Dramatic contrast. And you couldn't have anything more contrasting than that strong march and this lovely, wistful, lyric uh, idea in the clarinets. Now, as things develop in the middle of this uh, quite dramatic movement, uh, he makes much of that march um, and eventually uh, actually begins to help us see some uh, similarities uh, to the motto uh, by bringing it back in the middle of this rising action of the play. But the more dramatic moment comes when we're ready to reprise everything. And uh, what he does here is he uh, moves ahead uh, and that march is gonna come back roaring like a lion, not just with horns, but this time with trombones. Uh, and it's so uh, exciting and the motto uh, will uh, precede it first as an introduction uh, to begin to help us see the similarities uh, between these two very dramatic ideas. And he's gonna pull it all together at the end of this movement. Um, so let's come in um, at the end. <laughs> going to bring us uh, back to uh, reminiscences of the Largo, uh, the melody from the Largo. And the scherzo, some of the chords that open the Largo and the little sprightly rhythmic figure. But he crowns it all.
What an inspiring work written by an inspiring composer who wouldn't give up. I hope you get a chance to listen to the whole thing. Thank you so much. My name is Rose Breckenridge.